Hi everyone, this is Blood on the River, Chapter 13. As I understand by report, I am much charged with starving the colony. I did always give every man his allowance faithfully, both of corn, oil, aquavitae, etc., as was by the council proportioned. Edward Maria Wingfield, A Discourse of Virginia. Master Wingfield is no longer our president. He's under arrest, locked up on the discovery, and his private store of wine, dried beef, eggs, oatmeal, and other good food has been shared equally among all of us. He says he was keeping it to dole out to us if we ran out of provisions, but that didn't keep the council from voting him down. Now we have Captain Radcliffe as our president. Captain Smith says we have gone from the frying pan into the fire. Reverend Hunt is looking much better. Many of us gave him some of our share of eggs and meat, and so he's been eating well for days. We've had rain, too. Great drenching storms of it. We've caught it in buckets and barrels to drink, and the river is no longer so salty. The rainwater tastes so sweet. I would think it had honey in it. Reverend Hunt has color in his cheeks again, and he's able to lead Sunday services for the first time in many weeks. Captain Smith has taken all of the credit for discovering Master Wingfield's stash, and for that, I am grateful. Henry has no idea it was I who told, and so he's had no compulsion to kill me. Richard is much better now, too. I'm relieved. I decide to take the first step toward becoming his friend. Richard, do you want to see my sword? I ask one day when he's up and looking stronger. I could show you some of what Captain Smith is teaching me. Richard looks at me warily, as if he thinks this could be a trick. I just thought you might be interested, I say quietly. I look down, avoiding his eyes. There is silence between us. And then Richard says, are you ready to fight a duel yet? I cringe. Is he challenging me to a duel? But when I look up, he's grinning. <laughs> Not yet, I tell him. But Captain Smith says I'm learning well. Come on, I'll show you a few things. I let Richard try on my armor and have him fasten the belt around his waist so he can feel the weight of the sword, too. He pulls the sword out of its sheath and holds it in both hands. I tell him about what Captain Smith is teaching me, the footwork and the sword work. Suddenly, Richard closes his eyes and a look of pure sadness comes across his face. Richard, Richard, what is it? Are you going to faint? I never should have had him try on heavy armor when he's barely well. He shakes his head. James, he says, if... He stops himself to keep from crying. I know, I say. I've thought about it a hundred times. If only James had had armor, he might still be alive. Richard nods, grateful that I have said what he was thinking. Then a thought strikes me. Richard, you need armor. So many have died. There must be extra. Let's go talk to Captain Smith. Together we go to Captain Smith to ask. He takes a good look at Richard. He's a couple of inches shorter than I am and somewhat wider. Captain Smith scratches his beard thinking. No one as slight as Master Clovel has died, but we will cut some armor down to fit you. The blacksmith is put to work to remake a chest plate. The first time Richard stands wearing his armor, he grins at me. I know I'm on my way to making a friend. Captain Smith decides that now that some of us are well, every able-bodied man must be skilled at using a musket. He gathers the men who are new to weapons, the commoners and servants, to begin training. He shows us how to keep the slow match burning by blowing the ash off of it every few minutes and how to use it to ignite the gunpowder. We learn each step. Prime the pan, charge the piece with powder, Put in the musket ball, ram down the charge, cock the match. We use a big tree with a mark on it as a target. The first time I fire my musket, the kick nearly throws me onto the ground. I miss the tree completely, but so do most of the others. By the end of our training session, my ears are ringing, my arms are sore, and I smell like gunpowder. But I've hit the mark three times. Captain Smith says we will continue to train each week until that tree is full of musket shot. The extra rations from, Mr. from Master Wingfield do not last long, and soon we're back to the wormy grains. I wonder why the natives do not mount another raid if they really want us gone. There are hardly 50 of us left, and those that are left are half starved and weak. Maybe they're just letting starvation finish us off, I think. Outside the fort is plenty of food. Fish, oysters, rabbits, berries, but there are also Indians hiding behind the trees. No one has the courage to venture out any farther than is necessary to dig the graves for our dead. Then, one day, I hear the words I've been dreading. 
Savages, arm yourselves. We're under attack. I hear the scraping of metal as the guards load the cannons. This is it, I think. They've been watching, waiting, maybe even counting our burials. They know we have only a few men left. They've come to wipe out our colony. Richard and I hurry to put on our armor and ready our muskets. And soon we hear shouts from outside the fort. But these are not the shrill battle cries I've expected any moment. They are calls of Wingapo. Richard and I run to the front gates of the fort. The gates have been thrown wide open, and natives, men, women, and children are walking in. They look around curiously at our rotting tents and the big iron pot hanging over the cook fire. They all carry baskets. When I see what's in the baskets, I gasp. They are filled with bread, corn, fish, meat, squash, and berries. The smell of the fresh bread makes me nearly faint with hunger. One of our soldiers tries to grab a chunk of meat right out of a basket, but the Indian man holding it puts up his hand abruptly to stop him. Captain Smith comes forward. He speaks in Algonquin with our visitors, and I listen closely, trying to understand what they are saying. They are here to trade. They will give us food from the recent harvest in exchange for our copper, hatchets, swords, and muskets. Captain Smith nods agreeably. I wonder if he'll actually give them swords and muskets. The Virginia Company has given us strict orders never to let the Indians get their hands on our weapons. Captain Smith translate for, translates for our leaders. Our visitors say that within the Powhatan Empire, there are tribes who are our friends and some who are our enemies. Our enemies are the tribes closest to us because they feel we are encroaching on their land. They are the Pescahe, whose land we are on, and also the, also the Winok, the Apamatuk, the Kiskiak, and the Kiokwanak. Our friends are the, are the Erotek, the Pamunki, the, the Mataponi, and the Yukonatand. Those who are our friends will intercede for us with our enemies. They will try to convince them that we pose no threat, that we are only using a small piece of land and we are not making war with them. They also tell us we should cut down the tall grass near our fort because that's where our enemies are hiding when they shoot at us. Captain Smith tells them we are thankful for their message and for their peacekeeping efforts. Then he invites them to come sit in our common eating area around our fire pit. We all watch hungrily as they negotiate the trading. Captain Smith drives a hard bargain. He will not give away a single bead cheaply. By the time the Indians leave, all the baskets of food have become ours. They leave with some colorful glass beads, mirrors, bells, needles, pins, several pieces of copper, and three hatchets. Captain Smith does not trade away a single sword or musket.